and welcome to the Scottish Green Party podcast. I'm Lorna Slater, one of the party co-leaders. Um, so my name's Amy, um, I'm 22. Um, I currently, I've just graduated university a few months ago, so I'm currently in the process of trying to find kind of a full-time job. So I've basically spent a lot of time volunteering in the community and recently I've taken on a couple of um, roles towards anti-racism and specifically anti-racism education. So that's kind of why I am doing this at the moment is just trying to kind of spread the message and open up conversations and start some more awareness. And I really appreciate you joining me on the podcast. This is something that I want to learn more about and uh, it's something that we talk about a lot in the Scottish Green Party, that we're an overwhelmingly white party, that we don't necessarily deal with issues around race very well, that we haven't been able to welcome the kind of diversity of talent into the party that we'd like. So I'm here to listen and learn from you, Amy, today. Amazing. So this first thing I wanted to talk about is you and I don't actually know each other. We've never met. Uh, we were introduced through a mutual friend of ours, a woman that I care for a great deal, but who didn't feel comfortable coming on this podcast today. Can you tell us more about why she wasn't comfortable coming on? Um, so the main kind of issue is that it's really, really difficult to speak about race at work. Like it's really incredibly hard if you are the only person of color you're the only black person in your work like trying to speak up about race and be like okay these are these are the experiences of racism i've had in this particular workforce and this is the various microaggressions that you know these people have said to me like this is severely affecting my ability to work here like trying to have that conversation is so difficult and even just to try to have like you know speak about race like genuinely like not even particularly at that workforce that you're in like it's so hard when you are the only person there that is not white because it's just like you just feel so alone and you feel so isolated and like having those conversations is so hard and also a big issue is that the stereotype of the angry black women and that's particularly like why I personally have had a lot of instances where I haven't said anything at work because it's so easy for that narrative just to immediately be played and that people are like oh why why are you why are you always making it about race like that isn't the why have you brought that up like why are you getting so angry like I haven't said anything like I was trying to be nice and stuff like that and especially like with um like the potential like if you a lot of people have like recently a lot of celebrities have spoken up and they have lost their jobs and they've lost endorsements and they've had people completely boycott them and the companies that they work for even if the companies have supported them and it's like that fear of like being in that position where you're you know losing your job or you know losing your source of income and stuff like that just for literally speaking about your experiences is really really scary um, and I had a similar situation in my workforce um, a few years ago where my manager basically, um, I have an afro and I wear that and I was wearing that at work and my manager basically came up to me and was like, that's not professional, like you can't wear your hair like that, like that's not professional for our workforce. And like all of my white colleagues literally said nothing and like I was about to leave the job anyway so like I didn't say anything but it's like that's why in that situation and in our mutual friend situation why allies you know such as yourself and other people in the workforce are so important because you can like to stand up and be like i am the only person that will talk about this is terrifying and that is why allies are so important in particular is because you need that support in your workforce to be confident enough to speak up and know that people will support you because those stereotypes are so harmful so I had never heard of the angry black woman stereotype until our mutual friend told me about it. Can you tell us a bit more about that for those of us who aren't familiar? Yeah, so it's kind of, there's a lot of history behind it. So it kind of started in um, like TVs and in films where you'd always have the kind of black women that was stereotypically, you know, from the ghetto and, you know, was always like really like sassy and always kind of that side character that was always kind of very vibrant and loud. And that kind of just naturally, if you watch, if you watch films where there is a black girl, she will always be loud. She will always be, you know, very 
like talkative and very kind of animated and it kind of started there in films and tv so kind of what you see on film and tv is the perception of people that you genuinely take to in real life if you've never had a conversation with a black woman so if you're seeing these narratives on tv that all black women are really loud and feisty and aggressive and you know like that is the narrative that people like taken with them so that's kind of just how it started and a lot of times I've been in the classroom I've been hanging out with friends you know I've been in the workforce and people are like oh yes you know you're so sassy like and stuff like that and just like I am not like even if I was an out a loud person which I sometimes am like there's no like having automatically thinking that that's the type of person that I am just because of the perception of black women that you have is very harmful and a lot of you know a lot of black women are really quiet are really sensitive like I'm very quiet I'm very sensitive and I'm not always loud and a lot of the times people will look to me expecting me to be vocal and will expect me to say something and be really you know aggressive and vibrant and it's like it's not that's not I'm not always like that and not all black women are like that and it's just a very harmful stereotype because it you know it makes us seem like that's all that we have to us and that's obviously not the case so it's yeah mainly started in the media and it's kind of one of those stereotypes that really people innately don't even realize that they think that they think like that and it, it takes yeah it's very very harmful particularly in the workforce. It must be terrifying to think and I'm you know, I, I take the risk seriously that you could lose your job because you spoke up about an unfairness at work. Yeah, it's it's very scary, particularly recently with um, I can't remember his name. He's an American fo- football player. Colin um, Kaepernick. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm. When he obviously took the knee, and like everyone literally vilified him, like that was the most and that was literally the tiniest tiniest thing the fact that taking a knee during a game of sport to show solidarity that literally cost him so much and like so many people like boycotted him and all of the endorsements and things that he was involved with and it's like literally something so small as that caused a massive effect on your life and it's like you know, some people, they can't afford to lose their job. They can't afford to lose their income, you know? And it's like, what if then suddenly loads of companies are like, oh, well, this person is really vocal about race in the workplace. So like, we're not going to hire them in case, you know, something happens and they make a massive storm about our workforce and then people don't want to work for us. And then we get all of this hate, you know? So it's, it's terrifying. Like, it's so scary that you can't even speak your truth and you can't even say how you feel without the possibility of losing your job like it should not and that's why talking about race is like that's why all of this what's happening right now is such a massive step because people are talking about race in their households for their first time in their whole life and it's like the fact that those conversations are starting is what is such a big big step because if you can have those conversations it means that you know having the conversation doesn't necessarily need to be this huge deal. It's like, okay, we can have a seminar at work where we all talk about, you know, race and what we can do better. And it's like, if the conversation is what's so scary, then like that, there's just, you can't even progress from there. If the fact that having the conversation is like, is this massive, scary, big step that people would fire someone over, you know, like it has to, it has to progress like much more than that. So people, some people, and I don't agree with this, some people have said, oh, well, you know, America has big problems with race, but not in the UK. Yeah, so that is, that is Britain's biggest downfall um, in general, I would say, is that, is the pretending that racism doesn't exist. And I've had people my age that have, they're at university, they're educated, that I've had, you know, grown adults that are, you know, have been to university, done a PhD, and they're stood there telling me that racism doesn't exist in the UK. And I'm just like, how can you, as a white person, tell me a person, tell tell me a black person that has experienced racism from the day that I was five until literally 
every like till literally yesterday like how can you tell me that my experiences aren't valid like just because you have not heard with your own ears someone saying something racist does not mean it doesn't exist it's like if there was a government you know a government report that came out and said xyz you know you would be like okay the government's collected those statistics that is obviously fact because they have spoken to people but it's like when it comes to racism it's like why why can't why are you not able to look at statistics and accept them as fact like why does there have to be a nuance like why does there have to be something that doesn't quite add up for you to actually believe that it's true like you believe statistics about everything else and all the statistics are out there but when it comes to racism you just can't people just can't quite accept that it's that it exists and it's just it's so perplexing to me that someone has to hear with their own ears someone saying something racist for them to believe that it exists like it just doesn't make any sense so our mutual friend was telling me some of the things that have happened to her and i i was horrified yeah i mean ra like racism in, in the uk is of is huge like there's small things every day to you know people like, for example, like, Sheikh Bio in 2015, like, he literally was murdered by the police, like, for literally, like, for absolutely no reason. And it's, like, you've got instances like that up and, you know, like, it ranges from people being murdered by the police to, you know, everyday conversations of, you know, people telling you that your experiences, things you know for a fact have happened to you, people are telling you are not real, that, you that must be have been in your head that that's not what they meant that they're a good person and it's like the scale of racism is just is so big from small things to big things and it's like it affects everyone every single day and it's like to invalidate all of those experiences it's like okay like i've had i've been on alive for like 22 years and you know most 19 of those years pretty much i've experienced racism and it's like how can you tell me that that is real that that doesn't exist that i haven't experienced that because it doesn't fit with the idea of britain that you have in your head like that just that just doesn't it just doesn't compute to me so many people can't imagine something that they haven't experienced themselves yeah and i think a lot that's what it boils down to really a lot the big 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 thing is that is empathy and lack of ability to put yourself in other people's shoes and that's I was having this conversation with my friend the other, the other day and it really is you know if you haven't experienced oppression if you you know if you're a white male and you're you know if you're an upper class white male and you know you have never experienced you know any oppression in your life it's like how like your idea of like your lived experience is so far away from that of a black trans woman like so 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 far away and it's like you're there like that man's ability to empathize and understand how that black trans woman could walk through the world with so much violence and so much experience of oppression is just so far away from their reality that they have no ability to understand or empathize because they just like it's just not within their ability to understand and that's all it really boils down to is why the uk is so far away from dealing and getting a hold of racism is that people just can't empathize there's just no ability to empathize with someone else someone else's lived experience of oppression and of violence and it's just that's what i think the biggest issue is is putting yourself in other people's shoes because that's what if you're of an oppressed group that's 10 you genuinely are able to empathize with other people's experiences you know if you're a white queer person you know you genuinely can understand what oppression feels like and you can genuinely you know in some obviously you can't completely relate to racism but you can understand oppression in its in in some sort and have that ability to relate to someone else and that's kind of what it is is that people genuinely who are in politics and people genuinely who are in the parliament and positions of power their lived reality is so far away from someone who experiences so much oppression and so much violence that or when they're making policies and when they're making laws they have their lived experiences in their head and they have people's experiences their family members that look like them that share their experiences that's what they have in their head when they're making policy is me as a white upper class man if i make this policy how would it affect me if i how is it going to affect me and that's why politics 
it's so hard for, it's that's why i particularly do not like getting involved in politics and why i think a lot of other people of color hate getting involved in politics is that because we know that the people who make laws and the people who do politics they make the laws and they make policies based on their own lived experiences so if you're going into a conversation and you you know as black trans women you're like okay i've experienced this oppression i've experienced this i've experienced this this is my lived reality how is someone so far away from that lived experience going to be like okay like i i'm going to take that into account and i'm going to make this policy based on you know, your lived experience, like, that's so, it's so hard to be that vulnerable and to put yourself out there and to tell your truth, knowing that that person, the likelihood of them taking your lived experience into account, making laws that support you is just, is very unrealistic, so. I think you're right, there's, um, this, there, it's hard to imagine, so I'm a white middle-class woman, so i the amount of pressure that I receive is very limited. I, I recognize my privilege there. Uh, I do recognize a tiny amount, though, that, that kind of awareness, that hyper awareness whenever you're in a public space, that hyper awareness at work of how you're being perceived and of the stereotype that you don't want to fall into and that kind of thing. And yourself, um, you you know, you're ticking two boxes. Uh, you you must have that doubled or maybe squared that kind of hyper awareness, that permanent anxiety all the time. Yeah, I I mean I'm uh you know I'm a black bisexual woman like I I I'm in a lot of marginalized spaces and yeah like I constantly new spaces that I'm going into particularly you know I have to decide if you know if I'm going for this job are they going to be looking at my social media you know so they'll instantly see that I you know I'm a black queer woman like how is that and I like. I constantly, whenever I go into spaces, I constantly am thinking, okay, like what, what stereotypes are they going to be thinking about me? How do I want to dress? How am I going to present myself? How are these people going to perceive me? If I'm the only black person in the room, you know, if I'm the only queer person in the room, how, like, I instantly know that they're going to take what I say as speaking for my, both of my entire communities, you know, so how... Like, what weight do I want to take? Like, how much weight do I want to take from this conversation, from this meeting, from this job? How much space, like, how much am I willing to take up? Because I know that automatically I'm going to be seen as speaking for the whole black community when I am myself mixed race. So I therefore cannot speak for the whole black community. I can only speak for, you know, the mixed race community. And that's, you know, that's a whole separate thing. And then I then you know then are they expecting me to speak for the whole queer community well obviously i can't because i'm only bisexual so it's like and then you know they're expecting me to speak for the whole of you know the female population it's like well you know then you've got whole different range of gender spectrums it's like well i'm one person and i automatically know that most workforces and most places will expect me to be speaking for the whole communities and i think that's a huge huge thing um, particularly going forward and things that you can think about within the party within politics in general is you know is token like is like tokenism and making sure that you know that one person isn't seen as speaking for everyone and you know everything is always you know this is one person this is their lived experience and this is their opinions but they don't speak for everyone and they are not the entire representation of the community and that's always a very very thin line to be wary of and to be careful of because you know each different like my lived experience is so different to you know a dark-skinned black queer woman you know like because our lived realities are so different so each person's ex like each person's lived experience is just their own and cannot speak for everyone so it, we've recognized um allies like myself have recognized that it's not enough just to not be racist that we need to be anti-racist what does that mean what should we be doing so the difference between not being racist and anti-racism is you know is speaking up and speaking out and reflecting on yourself because you know if you're like okay me as a person i have never said i've never said the m word i've never you know i've never said this i've never said that i'm 
I'm okay, I'm a good person, like that, that's not, that's not it, that really is not it, and that will never be it, that's really not what it is, it's being like, okay, yes, I've not said the n-word, but, you know, I have touched a black woman's hair without asking, or I have inherently made this stereotypical assumption about, you know, this person, or I have maybe, or I was writing this policy, or I was writing this, and I know for a fact that I did not think about how this would affect black communities, or I made this, or I did this, and I know for a fact that I had preconceived notions of this group when I made this policy, and it's, and then being like, okay, why did I do that? Why, why did I have, why did I have that thought? Why did I have that stereotype? Where did that come from? Why did I learn that? And going forward, constantly checking yourself and be like, okay, I thought this, but why did I think that? Where did that thought come from? How can I unpack that? How can I do better going forward? And also just knowing that, you know, it's okay to get things wrong. It's so much easier to be like, okay, I'm trying and I can get this wrong than being like, I'm not going to have this conversation. This conversation is too difficult for me. This is too uncomfortable and I don't want to deal with this. And also being like, okay, now that I know that I've checked myself and I'm committed to checking myself going forward, now I want to speak out and encourage others to check themselves and encourage others to ask themselves, what they can be doing and you also have to ask yourself why now you know why now not two years ago why not five years ago why not 10 years ago why is anti-racism only important why is anti-racism more important to me now than it was earlier on and is it because of how much media attention the black lives matter movement has got right now is it because you know you're getting pressurized from other people to do it like why you constantly have to be thinking those questions to yourself why now why not earlier what, like why have i where have these thoughts come from and it's constantly just being able to unlearn because you know, I was speaking to my friend the other day and, you know, she was like, oh, you know, you seem like you know so much and stuff like that. And it's like, I, you know, black people don't just wake up and pe people don't just wake up one day with all the answers and understanding how, you know, systematic institutional racism happens. Like, you know, we have to do the learning ourselves. We have to read the books. We have to read the documentaries. We have to watch the films. We have to speak to people. We have to look at our history. We have to learn all of it ourselves first you know, so we all have done the work ourselves. And then, you know, we then have had to do unlearning from society itself. We have had to unlearn the internalized racism. I've un had to unlearn internalized homophobia. I've had to unlearn internalized sexism. You know, we have to unlearn all of that first before we can actually start doing the work, you know? So like we have already all done that work. And it's funny because I think most white people have this idea that we somehow have all this knowledge and you know but we have we've done the same readings we said we've done the same articles you know we've done the same work and it's just that we have ha we don't have a choice whether we learn about it or not because you know what the second you start you know the first time i experienced racism i was five or six you know and it's like you know the second i started getting eight nine ten and started understanding what was being said to me and trying to get to terms with why people were telling me to go back to my own country and why people were telling me that you know I didn't belong here like trying to understand that I I had to go and do research I had to go and look at things I had to have go have conversations the only reason it seems like we know everything is because we have no choice but to understand why we are being oppressed and why we are experiencing racism we have to do that work very early on in our young years and now that we're older in our 20s and in our teen years we have done all the reading we've done all the education and that's why it seems like we know everything Thing, but we you know we really don't it's just because we have no choice well we have no choice but to read and but to look at things because trying to get to terms with why people hate you for no reason is a hard thing to get to terms with so that's kind of where it kind of stands is that you know you just have to constantly be committed to looking at yourself and having those conversations i think i need to challenge myself i'm just looking at the books on my shelf here and I, I, not even like two of the books are written by women. I would, I would go through, I bet I could go through my house and 95%, maybe more written by white men. Yeah, it's, it's, that's another point. Like it's really, it's really, 
you only learn what you like your ability to understand only come from what you're reading what you're taking in and it's like that's another point that that comes down to education as well like particularly like like when I was in high school when even when I was at university like I literally had to fight with my professors to get like black literature in my like in the literature I was reading like they give you reading lists at the start of the semester and I'd be like this isn't good enough like this is literally a sociology class like this is a criminal justice class like why are why is all white men like how do you expect me to learn about society and how do you expect me to understand social dynamics if you're only giving me literature from white men like how do you expect anyone to understand society and be a good sociologist if your whole understanding of the world comes from a white man's perspective and that's kind of where it starts you just have to broaden out and even if it's just you know like podcasts for example there's so many amazing podcasts by black women and it's just like even things like that you know like a quick podcast on your way into work or you know a quick short video on youtube or you know like looking at more like black women literature like whether that's fiction or non-fiction like there's so many things that you can do to expand your knowledge because yes empathy is hard and yes seeing you know understanding other people's lived experiences is hard but the more you take in in different mediums the easier that is to understand someone else's lived experience because you've come across it more it's not such a you know foreign concept to understand how you know a black trans woman sees the world like that's not so different from it doesn't seem such a big leap from your lived experience if you've already if you're taking in multiple mediums of that of their lived experience it becomes just so much easier to connect with and understand how they would experience the world than you did before so we talked we touched on this bit earlier when you talked about um, how politicians and policymakers are you know default to the privileged white man that um diverse a diverse set of opinions particularly around race and so on gender issues are not taken into account so as a an aspiring politician myself what i would my response would be well that's because we need more diverse voices in politics we need more black women we need more black queer women in politics we need more disabled people we need more trans people we need that diversity do you have any suggestions for us how we can attract that kind of diversity so that we can put people with a more uh, different lived experiences into parliaments and into councils yeah i think it really it starts with kind of like reaching out and like where like what areas you're going to and like who you're speaking to because a lot of the times um like with you know politics people will just have this idea of like where they the places they need to go to speak to people and like how they can reach the community but like a lot of times like they kind of just need to think okay like I'm going to these places and I really am not seeing that many, you know, BAME people. So why am I not seeing these people and where do I need to be going to to find those people and to have those conversations? Because, you know, like and going to the same areas and the same schools and the same, you know, community centers like that really isn't going to you really aren't going to change your like you aren't really going to increase the diversity of who you're getting to the um to the party if you're going to the same places so it's you know going to faith centers and going to you know different areas of the community and going to you know different schools and just going to different areas that you stereotypically do so that you're trying to make sure that you are getting the most diverse um voices and that you are getting a wide range a wide range of voices so it's not just going to the same places because like i know for the area that i'm in you know the like it's i'm in a i live in a very majority white area at the moment and it's like the same you know it's always i always get leaflets and i always get people coming from the same parties and it's like if they were trying to do the same and they wanted to increase their diversity obviously going into stereotypically white areas over and over again really isn't going to increase your diversity and you really aren't going to hear those voices if you're doing if you're just going to the same places over and over again so it's really about just going yeah just expanding um where are you going um and looking at like different demographics and different areas and seeing where people are um and also like looking online as well there's a lot of really really um young outspoken people on social media um that are like young being people that are on social media so things like that you know like seeing 
you know, who they're speaking to and where, you know, where they're, what universities they're going to and, and what colleges they're going to and kind of seeing like where, you know, BAME people are going and where they're more likely to go and kind of seeing, you know, how can we adjust our, where we're tackling, what areas we're going to and how can we hopefully include more voices in like in our party. As a last, as a sort of final wrap up question, Amy, um, do you have any, like anything else you'd like to say to me as a white person to get off your chest um, or about what, what we can do, what white people, white women can do better to support black women uh, to, to show solidarity? Um, I think the biggest thing is that particularly like with white women in particular, like you know, the feminism era and, like, the past kind of five, six years has been this massive push for feminism. And, you know, people as, you know, girls as young as 13, 14 are like, I'm a feminist, like, I'm an outspoken feminist, like, I want gender equality and, you know, like, feminism taken such a big push. But it's, like, it's quite funny because I've had conversations with my friends and they're like, oh, I'm a feminist. And I'm like, okay, like but the thing that you've just advocated for directly hurts black women and it's like if you're just fighting for white feminism that's just white supremacy like white feminist like if your feminism only includes white women then that's just white supremacy like that that that's literally that's all it is and it's like you have to you can't just elevate white women you can't just elevate women that look like you you have to think how can my feminism be inclusive of everyone because there's a lot of policies that you know there's a lot of it's like okay you know all the studies that come out to do with feminism and the point that people focus on is oh you know there's a gender pay gap and you know in this workforce this white woman earns less than this you know white man and it's like well if you actually look the black woman actually earns less than both the white woman and the white man and probably earns about half of the time of the white half of that of the white woman so it's like if you have just gone into that workforce and you're focusing on gender equality and it's like you literally haven't even included every other woman in that conversation you've just had and it's just like you constantly try and look at things with an intersectional nature so i always like for i always try and think okay like how would the most disadvantaged person how would this experience how would this policy how would this idea how would that help or hinder them and you always kind of have to look at it with that lens is how would the most you know marginalized person how would this policy affect them and that's kind of how you have to look at things in general whereas that's whether that's in policy or whether that's just in your daily life you know you just have to start expanding your lens of experiences and looking at things you know broader and trying to think about how you can include everyone rather than just people that may look like you well, thank you so much today for joining me on the podcast, Amy. It has been brilliant to listen to you and learn from you. And I've definitely got some actions that I'm going to go away and do. No problem. It's been really great to talk to you. And then